In this video I will be looking at Unit 4, Topic 6 of A2 Biology at Excel. I will be looking at viruses, bacteria and at non-specific, specific passive and artificial immunity. So pathogens are agents that can cause disease. They can enter our body and the internal environment of an organism is ideal for viruses, bacteria, fungi and other pathogens because it offers a source of nutrients, a protected setting which allows the pathogen to grow and reproduce. The body has dedicated immune cells that interact with and destroy pathogens. There are a variety of ways in which pathogens can enter the body. In this picture we can see that they can enter through the eyes, through the nose, mouth, so what we ingest, through ears, through broken skin and wounds. Infection is an invasion of a host organism's bodily tissues by disease-causing organisms and their multiplication and the reaction of the host tissues. An infectious disease results from an infection that can cause a clinically evident illness. With an infectious disease, you have to have characteristic medical signs and symptoms. The difference between signs and symptoms, symptoms can only be described by the person feeling them, so they give you a general indication of a problem, but not necessarily pinpoint to a particular medical condition. Whereas signs are indicators of a problem and are used as medical evidence that may indicate a medical condition. So the definition of the immune system is that it is a system of biological structures and processes within an organism that protects against disease. To function properly, the immune system must first detect a wide variety of agents, which we refer to as pathogens, which includes viruses, bacteria and parasitic worms. And then the immune system has to distinguish them from the organism's own healthy tissue. In this diagram here we can see the human lymphatic system and the lymphatic system consists of lymphatic vessels shown in green through which lymph travels and structures that trap foreign substances. So these structures include the lymph nodes which are shown in orange which are strategically positioned around the body. The lymph organs which are in yellow so we have the spleen the thymus, tonsils and adenoids. The thymus is just above the heart and that's where T cells mature. The bone marrow, which is the soft tissue and bones, where B cells mature and red blood cells are made. The spleen is where the body breaks down red blood cells and white blood cells. Let's look at bacteria. So bacteria are single-celled prokaryotic microorganisms. So pro prokaryotic refers to the fact that they do not have a nucleus, unlike eukaryotic cells, which are animal cells. They're very small, so usually only a few micrometers long. They all have a plasma membrane, a cytoplasm and ribosomes. In this picture we can see a typical rod-shaped bacterium and on, this, on, the, on the right here we have a micrograph. So the key structures that we need to be aware of are the ribosomes which are shown here so these are the complexes that synthesize proteins Pro bacteria have a plasma membrane which is enclosing the cytoplasm and the cytoplasm is the liquid inside many bacteria also have flagella and these allow the bacterial cell to move most bacterial cells also have a cell wall which is a rigid structure outside the plasma membrane and the DNA in bacteria is not enclosed in a nucleus, but rather is just freely floating inside the cytoplasm. Some bacteria also have these little extensions, which allows them to attach themselves. So tuberculosis is caused by a type of bacteria, which is called Mycobacterium tuberculosis, and it infects the phagocytes in the lungs. It causes an infection which leads to lung disease. Transmission can happen through coughing, sneezing and other respiratory fluids and particles. A Mantu test, skin test, can be done to test if a person has TB. 
TB does not usually develop straight away because the immune system seals off the infected phagocytes in tubercules. And on the right we have an x-ray and we can see these patches in the lungs. So these are the sealed off tubercules where the infected phagocytes are contained. So at first the bacteria becomes dormant inside and the infected person has no obvious symptoms. However, the dormant bacteria can reactivate and overcome the immune system causing TB. So reactivation will usually happen in people that have a weakened immune system. So for example, they have AIDS. So the time between the infection and the development of TB can vary from weeks to years. Symptoms of tuberculosis can at first include fever, general feeling of weakness, severe coughing, which is caused by the inflamed lungs. As the progress, as TB progresses, it damages the lungs and if left untreated can cause respiratory failure and ultimately death. TB can also spread to other body parts, so for example the brain or the kidneys, which can cause multiple organ failure and ultimately death. Viruses are microorganisms, but they are not cells. They have nucleic acids, which are surrounded by a protein code known as the capsid. They're very small, so 0.1 micrometers. They have no plasma membrane, and no cytoplasm, and no ribosomes. They invade, and then they use the cells of the host and the machinery inside the cells to reproduce. There is a big debate in the scientific world as to whether viruses are living or non-living. So what is life defined as? So life is defined as an organism state, which is characterized by the capacity for metabolism, growth, reaction to stimuli and reproduction. Viruses cannot reproduce or carry out metabolic activities outside a host cell. They can only do that when they're inside a cell. They do not respond to stimuli. So the majority of scientists agree that they exist in a grey area between life forms and chemicals. And some refer to them as a kind of borrowed life. On the right we have two examples of different types of viruses. On the left we have adenovirus. As I said, inside is the free-floating DNA. and the outside we have the capsid. Some vi viruses also have glycoproteins projecting, which allows them to attach to host cells. And on the right is the influenza virus. So inside the capsid we have RNA and which is enclosed in an envelope, and again it has glycoproteins. HIV is a retrovirus, meaning that it contains an enzyme, which is called reverse transcriptase, which transcribes an RNA template into DNA, which means there is a, re a reverse flow. So usually transcription happens from DNA to RNA, but in HIV the reverse happens, so we're transcribing RNA into DNA. HIV retrovirus causes AIDS, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. HIV infects and then destroys the immune system cells. AIDS leads to deterioration of the immune system and, and, and its ultimate failure. So HIV is an enveloped virus with two identical single-stranded RNA and it also has two molecules of reverse transcriptase, which is the enzyme which can transcribe RNA into DNA. People that have the acquired immunodeficiency syndrome develop other diseases and infections that generally don't cause problems in people with normal immune function. Time between the infection with the HIV virus and the development of the syndrome can range from 8 to 10 years. Symptoms of AIDS include initially minor infections of mucous membranes, so such as in the nose or ears, and recurring respiratory infections because there is a lower number of immune system cells. As AIDS progresses, the number of immune cells starts to fall, so the patient becomes more susceptible to more serious infections, such as chronic diarrhea and tuberculosis. In the very last stages of AIDS, a very low number of immune cells remain, which may lead to toxoplasmosis, which is a parasite infection of the brain. It can also cause fungal infections of the lungs. So the key point here is that it does not cause death. It's actually these opportunistic infections 
which cause death because a person suffering from AIDS has a very weak immune system. In this diagram um, we can see the replication cycle of HIV. So we start off where the enveloped glycoproteins um, on the surface of the HIV virus allows it to bind to specific receptors on certain white blood cells. When the virus fuses with the cell's plasma membrane, the capsid proteins are removed, re releasing the viral proteins and RNA. The reverse transcriptase catalyzes synthesis of DNA, which is complementary to the viral RNA. Again, the same enzyme then catalyzes the synthesis of a second DNA strand complementary to the first, which then can enter the nucleus and can be incorporated as a provirus into the cell's DNA. After the incorporation, the proviral genes are transcribed into RNA molecules, which serve as a genome for the next viral generation. We use the messenger RNA for translation into viral proteins. The viral proteins include capsid proteins and reverse transcriptase made in the cytoplasm and also enveloped glycoproteins made in the ER. Vesicles then transport glycoproteins to the cell surface membrane as shown here and the capsids are assembled around viral genomes and reverse transcriptase molecules and finally the new virus buds off from the host cell and on the left here we can see an HIV virus binding to the membrane of a white blood cell and when the new virus buds off from the host cell. So what is immunity? Immunity is defined as the state of having sufficient biological defenses to avoid infection, disease or other unwanted biological invasions. And it's the capability of the body to resist harm or microbes from entering it. The immunity of a person involves both specific and non-specific components. The non-specific component acts either as a barrier or as an eliminator of a wide range of pathogens, irrespective of antigenic specificity. Other components of the immune system adapt themselves to each new disease encountered and are able to generate pathogen-specific immunity. General term immunity can be divided into two broad categories, adaptive and innate immunity. Everything that's alive on Earth has innate immunity. Adaptive immunity can be further subcategorized into natural and artificial. Natural and both natural and artificial can then be further subdivided into either passive or active. Passive applies to pregnant women or breastfeeding mothers who can pass on antibodies to the infant through either breast milk or pl the placenta and active refers to vaccinations. So what barriers does the body have? First we have the stomach acid. If we ingest anything it can be quickly killed off by the acidic conditions because of the low pH but some could still pass into the intestines. But it's covered in harmless microorganisms called flora so then they compete with pathogens for nutrition so due to the limited space and nutrition, this limits the number of pathogens that can grow in the intestines. Skin is the biggest organ in the human body, so it creates a physical barrier. But if you have a cut in the skin, pathogens can enter the body and then into the bloodstream. One way that the body tries to avoid that is by creating a clotting cascade, which then prevents further entry and blood loss. We also have lysozymes, which is an enzyme which is found in mucosal surfaces. So for example, tears, saliva, or mucus. And this, um, this enzyme kills bacteria by damaging the cell wall. So the bacteria lies, so the bacteria will burst. Let's talk in more detail about the nonspecific immune response. So as I already said, all animals have innate immunity, which is nonspecific, which is a defense that is active immediately upon infection. Cells of the innate system recognize and respond to pathogens in a generic way. But unlike the adaptive specific immune system, it does not confer long-lasting or protective immunity to the host. So the, ma the major functions of the innate immune system include recruiting immune cells to site of infection through the production of chemical factors such as cytokines, 
the activation of the complement cascade to identify bacteria, so activating cells and to promote clearance of antibody complexes in dead cells out of the body. Also, the identification and removal of foreign substances through the blood and lymph by specialized white blood cells. Also, the activation of the specialized immune system through antigen presentation and acting as a physical and chemical barrier to infectious agents. So foreign antigens are recognized by the immune system, which then produces an immune response. An antigen, usually either protein or a polysaccharide, which is found on the surface of cells. Pathogens can enter the body and the antigen can then be recognized as a foreign material, which activates the immune system in two ways. So either specific or non-specific. The non-specific immune response is present in all organisms, but not antigen-specific. So there are three main ways of attack. One is inflammation of the infection site, the production of antiviral proteins called interferons, and phagocytosis. Let's first look at inflammation. Side of inflammation, this is recognized by the bodies that histamine is secreted, which triggers the inflammation, which then leads to vasodilation and vasodilation is the widening of blood vessels. This allows more, more blood to flow through the area and an increase in permeability of the vessel allows immune cells to move out of the bloodstream to the side. So here, in this diagram here we can see the splinter going through the skin, so the splinter is the pathogen, the mast cells and macrophages release signaling molecules. Vasodilates the vessel, allowing the neutrophils to move out from the bloodstream and to the infection site. And finally, the neutrophils then digest the pathogens and cell debris, and the tissue is allowed to heal. Let's look at the production of antiviral proteins, which are called interferons. So if the cell is infected with the virus, it secretes proteins that are called interferons, which can prevent spread to uninfected cells, which means that nearby cells produce a substance to inhibit viral reproduction, activates a specific immune response. And the promotion of inflammation brings immune cells to the site. So in this diagram, we can see host cell 1 and host cell 2. So host cell 1 is the one that's infected with the virus. It makes interferons. And by releasing them, the nearby cell can recognize these. It turns on the genes for antiviral proteins. The type of nonspecific immune response that we need to know about is phagocytosis. A phagocyte also known as a macrophage, is a type of white blood cell that carries out phagocytosis, which is the engulfment of pathogens. They're found in the blood and in tissues, and they are the first cells to respond to a pathogen inside the body. Phagocyte recognizes the antigens on the pathogen. The, the cytoplasm of the phagocyte moves around the pathogen, engulfing it. The pathogen is now contained in a phagocytic vacuole, which is a bubble, in the cytoplasm of the phagocyte. A lysosome, which, is an, it, which contains a digestive enzyme, can then fuse with the vacuole and break down the pathogen. The antigen from the pathogen can then be presented on the phagocyte. The antigen that is on the surface activates other immune system cells. The specific immune response is antigen specific, so it produces a response that are aimed at specific pathogens. It involves white blood cells called T and B cells. Phagocytosis activates T cells. T cells are covered in receptors and when they bind to a complementary antigen, they are activated which then leads to the division and differentiation into either a T helper cell, T killer cell or T memory cell. T helper cells uh, release substances that activate B cells, T cells and other microphages. T killer cells attach to antigens on infected cells and kill them. T helper cells then also activate B cells. B cells are another type of white blood cell. They're covered with proteins, which are called antibodies. 
and antibodies can bind to antigens to form antigen antibody complexes. Each B cell has a different shaped antibody on its surface. So when the antibody on the surface of the B cell meets a complementary antigen, it binds to it. So each B cell can only bind to one particular antigen. This, together with the substances that are released from T cells, activates the B cells. So the activated B cell then divides by mitosis into plasma cells, also called B effector cells and B memory cells. Plasma cells, also known as B effector cells, are clones of B cells. So they secrete specific antibodies for specific antigen into the blood. When an antibody combines with, with the antigen on the surface of pathogen, it produces an antigen-antibody complex. Let's look at the structure of a B cell antigen receptor, as shown here on the right. It has a Y-shaped structure. It has two identical heavy chains, which are shown here, which go through the membrane, and two identical light chains. There is also a variable region, which is shown here at the top. So this is where the antigen will bind, and the variable region will sh uh, shape will be complementary to the antigen. So the variable region will differ between antibodies. There is also a constant region, which is shown here, and this allows the binding to receptors of the immune system cells, so such as phagocytes. And this constant region is common to all antigen receptors. The disulfide bridge, which is shown here in yellow, holds the polypeptide chains together. What are antibodies? They do not kill the pathogens, but by binding to antigens, they mark pathogens for inactivation and destruction. Agglutinating pathogens is when one antibody has two binding sites, which means that it can carry two path pathogens at the same time. So that this uh, produces a cluster of pathogens, which allows phagocytes to bind, and through the process of phagocytosis, many pathogens can be destroyed at the same time. Neutralizing toxins, antibodies bound to antigens on the surface of a virus, neutralize it by blocking its ability to bind to a host cell. And finally, preventing pathogens from binding to human cells. This is done when an antibody can bind to an antigen to the pathogen, preventing it from binding to the host cell as the receptor is now blocked, which means that it cannot attack or infect the host cell. The immunological memory gives us long-term protection. So post-exposure to an antigen alters the speed, the strength and the duration of the immune response. The primary immune response is when the pathogen enters the body for the first time and the antigen will activate the immune system. The primary immune response is usually slow because there are not many B cells that make a particular antibody for that specific antigen. B cells and T cells to produce effector memory B cells. So the person will experience the symptoms of the disease until it's overcome and the B memory cells stay in the body for a long time so they remember the specific antigen and will recognize it again. If the person is exposed to the same antigen a second time, the response will be much faster, between two to seven days, of greater magnitude and more prolonged, and this is known as a secondary immune response. Because there are already memory B cells in the bloodstreams, they will divide into plasma cells, and the plasma cells will then produce the right antibody and the memory T cells will then create the correct type of T cells to kill the antigen carrying cells. So on the right in this diagram we can see primary response we can take we can see it takes a very long time. But when we ex when the exposure happens for a second time the secondary immune response is much quicker because they're already in the bloodstream. We also need to know about passive and active immunity. So active immunity refers to the immune system making its own antibodies after stimulation by an antigen. And active immunity is a long-term protection. 
Active immunity can be divided into natural and artificial. If it's natural, that is once you've had a particular disease, or it can be artificially induced after a vaccination. Vaccinations include the injection with a harmless dose of the antigen. Passive immunity is when the antibodies in the blood of pregnant women cross the placenta to the fetus. So the transfer of the antibodies can immediately react with any pathogens to which they are specific. And this will continue after the birth through breast milk, so while the infant's immune system is still developing. However, passive immunity is short term. So again, natural refers to the antibodies that the fetus received from the mother or artificial, which is after a vaccination. Vaccines are made from inactivated bacterial toxins or killed pathogens or parts of pathogens or weakened pathogens or genes encoding for microbial proteins. After injection, they cause the body to produce memory cells to a particular pathogen without causing symptoms or the disease. Vaccinations can also contain many different antigens, so for different strains. And the strains come about from antigenic variation. Antigenic variation allows pathogens to escape body's defenses, and this is because they are altering. So vertebrates have evolved better immune system to fight a greater variety of pathogens, but at the same time, pathogens have also evolved to evade the immune system. So this struggle between the pathogens and the hosts is referred to as the evolutionary race. So antigenic variation is a major reason that the influenza or flu virus is still a major public health threat. Because it mutates, it lessens the recognition from our immune system giving it a selective advantage. It changes the surface proteins, which means that we need to produce a new flu vaccine every year. Another example of antigenic variation is the 2009 pandemic of the swine flu, also known as H1N1, that can produce novel combinations of genes, which are normally found in pigs and birds. Latency refers to a dormant period after an infection with virus. If you're infected with herpes simplex viruses, they can stay dormant for a long period of time until conditions are favorable. So for example, if the person that has the herpes simplex virus becomes infected with another pathogen and the immune system is weakened, the herpes virus can then activate. So let's now look at how both HIV viruses and bacteria evolved their evasion mechanisms. So in HIV, the virus kills T helper cells that it infects. So overall, the number of killer T helper cells is reduced, which means that there are less cells that can detect the virus. Because of the high rate of mutation, the genes that code for antigen proteins leading to the change in antigen proteins on the surface, the memory cells that are produced by the body won't recognize another strain, which means a primary response will be needed for every new strain. When the virus integrates into chromosomes of the host, no production of the virus proteins or particles happens straight away, and it's also shielded from the immune system by the host cell. Inactive viral DNA is protected against antiviral agents because they can only attack viruses that are actively replicating. HIV can also disrupt antigen presentation in infected cells, which means those cells cannot be recognized by the immune cells. In TB, with the initial invasion, the bacteria are engulfed by phagocytes. Bacteria can produce substances that prevent the lysosome from fusing with the phagocytic vacuole, meaning that the bacteria is not broken down, which allows it to multiply undetected in the phagocytes. And it also disrupts the antigen presentation in infected cells, which again prevents the recognition from the immune system. There are two main types of antibiotics that we need to know about. Uh, one type is a bactericidal, which kills the bacteria, and the bacteriostatic antibiotics are the ones that inhibit the growth of bacteria. So in general, 
antibiotics in interfere with the bacteria's metabolism, which is crucial for its growth and life. There are different things that antibiotics can target or interfere with. So, for example, they can target the cell wall, which means that the cell wall cannot be synthesized because the bonds cannot be made, which means that the bacteria cannot grow, which leads to cell death. And cell death is also caused because water moves in by osmosis and the bacterial cell wall cannot withstand the pressure, so it bursts. An example of this would be penicillin. Antibiotics can also target cell membranes, bacterial enzymes or protein synthesis. In protein synthesis, antibiotics can bind to bacterial ribosomes and since all enzymes are proteins, if the protein synthesis is inhibited, enzymes cannot be produced, which means that no metabolic processes for growth or development can take place. The type of a protein synthesis antibiotic is a tetracycline. We can further categorize antibiotics based on target specificity. So we have narrow spectrum and broad spectrum. Narrow spectrum antibiotics target gram-negative or gram-positive bacteria. And it's quite important to know whether we have gram-negative or gram-positive because there is a difference in the cell wall. So by using a, a gram stain technique we can differentiate. If it's gram-positive it means it has a simpler wall and if it's gram-negative it has a much more complex wall. It's important because gram-negative bacteria have toxic lipid portions of lipopolysaccharides in the wall which can cause fever and shock. The bacteria are also more resistant to drugs because the drugs have to first go into the cell. Broad spectrum antibiotics target a wi wider range of bacteria. We also need to know about hospital acquired infections. These happen to patients that are being treated in the hospital. So, for example, common hospital acquired infections include MRSA and Clostridium difficile. People that are in hospital generally have a much, much weaker immune system, which means they're more likely to get it. In the UK, for example, there is an 8.2% infection rate, which means that up to 700,000 people or patients that are admitted to hospital will get a hospital acquired infection and between 4,500 to 7,000 will die. So how are hospital acquired infections transmitted? The main reason is due to poor hygiene, so staff and visitors not washing their hands properly between patients, also coughing and sneezing, so without using tissues or the equipment and surfaces not being disinfected properly. The NHS has introduced a number of codes of practice to help prevent and control the spread of hospital-acquired infections. So there are posters with hand-washing techniques located around the hospitals, disinfections of surfaces after use, and patients that have a hospital-acquired infection will generally be isolated. And the staff that go into the isolation room will you have to use PPE, personal protective equipment, for example aprons, to limit the spread of the infection. MRSA is, um, refers to methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus and it's resistant to most antibiotics so it's very difficult to treat and may lead to death. So infections in hospital are generally more resistant to antibiotics because more antibiotics are used there therefore the bacteria have evolved resistance. So a way to limit the resistance of antibiotics, doctors can prescribe less for minor infections or no prescriptions at all if they want to prevent an infection. Instead of using broad spectrum, it's better to use narrow spectrum antibiotics to treat the specific type also use a different variety of antibiotics, so in rotation, and patients should be advised to take the full course of antibiotics to make sure that the infection is fully treated. And finally, we also need to know how to test the sensitivity of bacteria with different types of antibiotics. So, and this is a useful way to, which allows us to find, find out which antibiotic is best suited to treat a patient's bacterial infection or a particular strain. 
So first of all, we need to spread the bacteria on an agar plate with a sterile swab. So in the petri dish, we will have agar nutrients. We then take paper discs that are soaked in different antibiotics and we place them apart on a plate. Make sure that they have different concentrations and we also need to have a negative control disc. So a control disc would be one that is soaked in sterile water. Steps one and two that I've just talked about have to be done with aseptic technique, which means under sterile conditions. So we have to use a Bunsen burner and sterilized instruments. So for example, sterilized forceps when we're transferring the paper discs. We then incubate this at 25 to 30 degrees for about 24 to 36 hours, which allows the bacteria to grow to produce a bacterial lawn. We can then observe and where the bacteria does not grow, there is a clear patch, and this is known as the inhibition zone. And the size of, it, of the inhibition zone will tell us how well that particular antibiotic is working. So the larger the, in the inhibition zone, the more inhibition there is. So we can then use a ruler to measure the diameter of the inhibition zone in millimeters. And this diameter, we can then refer to a specific table, will tell us bacteria is resistant, intermediate, or susceptible to that particular antibiotic. Bacteria that are unaffected are said to be antibiotically resistant. So here on the right I have an example. The antibiotic will diffuse from the paper into the agar. So let's first look at G here, which is which has no inhibition zone, which means that the bacteria is res resistant to streptomycin, which is that antibiotic here. If we look at H, we can see that H has a smaller inhibition zone than E. Antibiotic E has a better effect on that bacteria than antibiotic H. Discs A, D and C are very similar because they roughly have the same diameter, which means they are equally effective.